a good job. my way. 
feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. The psalmist is talking about the feasts. Three times a year, the Jews would go travel to Jerusalem for the feasts. And the psalmist is like this. When it was time for the feast in Jerusalem, I didn't just high five my neighbor and go, hey, bro, have a good trip and kiss the soil of Jerusalem for me when you get there. Here's 20 bucks. Stop at McDonald's and have lunch on me. The psalmist said, I got my family together. I wrestled down my calendar and we made that long trip to Jerusalem. And when it was time for the feast, my feet were standing in the gates of Jerusalem. I go to church to make a statement before heaven. I want the dust that's in the carpet to get on my shoes. And I want the dust on my shoes to be left in the carpet as a testimony before heaven. When your people were gathered in your name to lift up the name of Jesus, to make a statement in the community, and to resist powers and principalities of the air, when the people of God gathered in the house that you have zeal for, my feet were in the house. I go to, to church to make a statement in the presence of heaven. Hallelujah. Having said that, I don't go to church to get fed. <laughs> Sunday morning is not my feeding ground. When I want to get fed, I go to the secret place. I've got a source in God that's not limited to Sunday morning. Actually, I feel a little bit sorry for Christians that go to church to get fed. You poor star and thy look at you, dragging your carcass into the building, collapsing with the spiritual oxygen tank on your back, and wishing to heaven that something will come from the preacher to keep you alive for one more week. Listen, Jesus didn't die for you to live off one meal a week. He died to give us a rich, abundant, overflowing love relationship with Him every day, sitting at His feet, hearing the rainers of His mouth, coming to life because of His Word in the secret place. So, if I go to church and the worship misses me and the sermon misses me, doesn't really bother me that much. Because I didn't come for that anyways. I came to make a statement in the presence of God. Serve the zeal you have for your house also eats me up. Bye. 
translated word. The Greek word rhema, we translate it word. And when you're reading your English Bible and you come across word, you can't tell from the English was it the Greek word logos or was it the Greek word rhema and the original. For example, you're in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. That one was Logos. And then when you're in Matthew 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That one was Rhema. We live by the rhemas of his mouth. That's your life. We have often defined them like this. They got it on the screen for me. We've often said a logos is the written word and rhema is the spoken word. And now the Bob Sorky homemade definition. A logos is the rhema God gave somebody else. Let me explain what I mean by that. When the writers of scripture got their message and came to them as rhema, they got it straight from heaven. It set their heart on fire and they're like, whoa. I'm going to write that down. They wrote it down and then they gave it to us. And when we got it, we got Logos. They got Rainbow because it came straight from heaven to their heart. We got Logos because we got it from them. So when a Rainbow comes from heaven and then they give it to you, it kind of gets downgraded to a Logos. You know what I mean? You can't give anybody a rhema. God gives you a rhema and you pass it on to somebody else. It kind of gets downgraded to a logos because the only way to get rhema is directly from heaven through the logos to your heart. Maybe you've experienced this already. You're in the secret place. You've got the logos open in front of you. And it happens. Ephesians 1, 17. The spirit of revelation comes on you. And you're like, oh my goodness. I've only read this verse a hundred times. I've just never seen it. And you are suddenly, you are seeing something in the Word of God. Like, man, I've never seen Jesus like this. Your faith comes alive. Your love is ignited. Hope springs alive inside of you. And you're going, that's my answer. I've been asking God for 10 years. This sets your heart on fire. I'm telling you, this is better than Starbucks. This will suck. This jazzes you. You're like, I just got my answer. You call your friend up on the phone and you go, I just got the best rhema I've gotten in 10 years. And your friend goes, Tell me. You share your rhema with your friend. She goes, Praise God. <laughs> what kind of a backslidden, sluggish, lame, deceiving, age believer are you? Anyways, I just gave you the best rhema I've got in 10 years. Just going to get them served on the silver platter today. 
so at least I'm appreciative, okay? I know how to do it. Long and loving meditation in the locals. When you have the locals in front of you, you are a holy setup. You are a ticking time bomb. You are positioned for the spirit of revelation. Ephesians 1 Timothy, the spirit of revelation to come upon you and bring you alive to the hidden riches, the hidden manna that's in the Word of God. Galatians 6. They got it. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will reap of the Spirit everlasting life. Here's the principle of our verse. Sow to the Spirit, you will eventually reap to the Spirit. Sow to the secret place, you will eventually reap to the secret place. So to the Logos, you will eventually reap to the Logos. Now I'm going to say it this way. So to the Logos, you will eventually reap Rhema. That's the secret. Just keep sowing. Just keep sowing. Because if you'll keep sowing to the Word every day in the Logos, every day in the secret place, every day position to hear His voice, I have a word for your life. One of these days, it's going to happen. The Spirit of Revelation is going to come upon you. He's going to speak something from His mouth to your heart that will bring you alive. Your eyes will light up. Your cheeks will flush. And you'll be able to live for another 40 days in your wilderness. Somebody might be thinking right now, Bob, your secret place must be awesome. Actually, no. <laughs> it's mostly dull, mostly boring, and mostly stoic. But I know something. I know a fault just keeps going. Every day in the secret place. Every day in the Logos. Every day at the feet of Jesus. Every day listening for his voice. I know a page of fault just keep on sowing. One of these days it's going to happen. And he's going to speak again a raiment to my heart that will bring me alive. And I'll be able to live in my wilderness. I experienced an awakening to the Word of God. That I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try to talk to you about it, David. I was a pastor of a church back when, in my young thirties. I was pastor in a church. I was preaching every weekend, and actually had not been awakened to the Word of God. And here's when it happened. When this happened to my voice. It catapulted me into the darkest tunnel of my life. And I started to come after God with the desperation of a dying man. And it was in my darkest hour as I was seeking him in his word, like trying to stay alive. He pulled up a chair in the darkness and began to feed me with the words of his mouth. He kept me alive in my darkest tunnel. And it was when his word became my survival. That's where I was awakened to the word of God. And now I wish for the whole body of Christ to be awakened to what we have in this book. It's my prayer for you, my brother, my sister, that God would awaken you to the riches of what we have in this book. And I don't wish for you to have to get my way, but I do wish for you 
to the awakening to what we have in this book. 31,103 verses to set your heart on fire. Somebody goes, well, they're having a prayer meeting at my church tonight. Prayer meeting. Guess I don't need my Bible. Excuse me. 31,103 verses to set your prayer life on fire and you went to a prayer meeting without this? It's unthinkable to me. When I'm in a prayer meeting, I'm just always praying for the Word. In fact, this is what I do with this book. I don't mostly read the Bible, Daniel. I mostly pray the Bible. I'm always looking for conversation starters. And so this is literally what my secret place looks like. Read the verse. Read the verse. Read the verse. Read the verse. This verse. I want to talk to you about this verse. And now I start talking to him using the language of scripture to become the language of my prayer life. Because when you're praying scripture, it puts boldness in your prayer life. And you never run out of stuff to talk about. 31,103 verses to inspire your prayer life. Now, there are some verses in this book I don't want you to pray. So and so begets, so and so begets, so and so begets, so and so. Don't pray that verse. But there are so many scriptures that are just waiting for us to engage in conversation with Jesus. Go to a prayer meeting without this? It's unthinkable to me. Somebody goes, uh, well, uh, they're having a night of worship at my church. Worship night. I guess I don't need my life. Excuse me. 31,103 verses to set your heart on fire in a worship service. And you went to a worship night without this sweet baby. I call it the worshiper's friend. Because when I'm in a worship service and they've got the lyric on the screen, the lyric on the screen, I'm going, oh my goodness, they are singing Ephesians 5. I was just in Ephesians 5. I'm pulling up Ephesians 5. Now the word is intersecting with the lyric and setting my heart on fire. I am always worshiping him from this book. Go to a night of worship without this. It's unthinkable to me. Somebody goes, well, my pastor now puts all the scriptures on the screen when she preaches on Sunday morning. I, or not the screen, but the wall. I guess I don't need to bring my Bible anymore. 31,103 verses to set your heart on fire and you came to the house without it. It's unthinkable to me. I'm going to share a pain point with you. David, can I just share my pain just a little bit right now? I go to churches literally around the world. I travel all over the place. And I can't tell you more often than not. I don't know the percentage of how often it is that I'll go to a church and I'll say something like this. Turn with me in your Bibles too. And I'll mention the scripture. And they will sit and look at me like you're looking at me right now. And I'm like, they don't have their Bible. They don't know 
that you would entice us. I'm asking, Lord, that you would awaken us to the riches of what you have given us in this book. When Jesus was baptized by John, the scripture says, the dove of the Holy Spirit came and rested on Jesus. Hear it carefully. The Holy Spirit loves to come and rest on the Word. I'd like to share a rainbow with you that God gave me. Would that be okay? I just need one hand. Preacher only needs one hand. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share a rainbow with you that God gave me. And uh, a warning. You're about to get a Logos. A rhema that God spoke to me. And I'm going to give you the context for when I got this rhema. I was in a season of, 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 of coming after Jesus in his word. I was studying or immersing myself is a better way to say it. I was immersing myself in the words of Jesus. You know how some Bibles have the words of Jesus in red ink? You know what I'm talking about? I was reading the red. So it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and it was Revelation 1, 2, 3. I was devouring the words of Jesus. Just the words of Jesus. And as I made this discipline, a certain word began to strike me. Like he said it there, and he said it there, and there, and there, 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 and there, there. Jesus used that word a lot. Here came the rainbow. It's the most important word in the whole Bible. I'm about to share with you the most important in the whole Bible. And I don't even care if you agree. Because when you get a ring at the feet of Jesus, you're not that moved by people's opinions. You know, you can like it or not like it. You can agree or disagree. It doesn't really move me that much. Because this one kept me alive in my pit. It kept me alive in my wilderness. I got this one straight from heaven. So I don't really care so much what you do with it. Jesus said of Mary, she sat at his feet, heard his word, and, and Jesus said, she has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. When you get something at the feet of Jesus, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can steal your rhema. So I'm going to share with you a rhema God gave me, the most important word in the Bible. Here. He who has ears to hear, well, let him hear. How many times did he say it? In the blockbuster parable of the sower, this one heard the word this way, this one heard the word this way, this one heard the word this way, this one heard the word with a good heart and it produced a harvest. A voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Somebody goes. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't agree with that. I think the most important part in the Bible is love. Okay. There is a verse that goes, Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God. Somebody goes, well, actually, I think the most important word in the Bible is faith. Okay? There is the verse that goes, faith comes by. Everything in the kingdom of God is predicated upon hearing. When you hear, now you can believe. When you hear, now you can obey. When now you can make the right decision. Everything in the kingdom, in the kingdom of God, opens up to us when we hear the 
word from the mouth of Jesus. Which is why when I go to the secret place, I don't go primarily to talk. I go to listen. Things don't change when I talk to God. Things change when God talks to me. When I talk, in case you haven't noticed, nothing happens. When God talks, universes come into existence. Everything in your life changes with one word from the mouth of Jesus Christ. One word of God can be so life transformative that it's worth a lifetime of sowing to wait for it. So I'm going to share with you what I think is maybe my favorite here verse. It's got that sweet little word here in it, and it's in red ink in the Bible. It's from the lips of Jesus. And I'm just going to try to share with you how important Luke 8, 18 is to me. This verse is so important that it's not good enough that it's on the on, on the wall. I want you to find it, get it on your device right now, get it in your Bible, whatever you got to do to find it. If you've got a way to get it in front of you, it's just that good. David's even going back for his device. Steelers country, but I'm going to try to be objective and 
and uh, just be a little generic on my illustration right now. Okay. <clears throat> Quarterback throws the ball. The receiver drops it. Quarterback goes. And that's still a second shot. And the receiver drops it. Quarterback's going. Tough day, bro. And that third touch shot. Receiver drops it. If I'm the quarterback in that story, I'd be like this. That's the last football I'm throwing your direction. <laughs> if you want the quarterback to throw you the football, you must have a proven track record of catching the footballs. And if you want Jesus to
given. And so I'm going to share with you how I catch footballs. Not because I want you to do it my way. I just want to inspire you, Daniel, to find your way. Here's my way. And to understand not me, you have to understand something about me. I have a horrible memory. If you don't think I just told you the truth, you just ask my brother after this meeting, and he will he'll confirm what I'm telling you. Where was I, Sheldon, on the day they were giving out the memories? I don't know, I missed that line or something, because I've got a sieve for a brain. It's just data in, data of chum, boom, chum, boom. What is the deal with my memory? Sometimes my wife will just go to me, she'll say, don't tell me you forgot that. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm sorry, babe. <laughs> when God gives me a rainbow, the only way that this pea brain can hold on to it, I have to write it down. If I don't write it down, it's gone. So, when I'm in a prayer meeting, I always have three things. Did I say always? I have a Bible, I have a notepad, and I have a pen. You will not find me in a prayer meeting without three things. And you're like, what's the deal? I'll tell you the deal. When I'm in a prayer meeting and I've got the word in front of me, because that's just what I do at prayer meetings, I just pray from the word. When I'm praying at the word, I'm excavating, I'm pulling on it, I'm expanding it, I'm, I'm pressing it, I'm talking to it from the scripture. When I'm in that kind of an exercise, I get some of my best footballs in prayer meetings. When he gives me a rhema in a prayer meeting, I am going to catch that ball. Write that baby down on my notepad. I go home from the prayer meeting straight to my laptop, tap it into my journal, copy paste it into my topical library. I've got a topical library in my laptop of Microsoft Word documents and files that I have alphabetically for me. That's real sweet. And I've got all these documents according to topic book. That's an insight on faith. It goes in my faith file. That's an insight on mercy. It goes in my mercy file. That's an insight on the life of Abraham. That goes in my Abraham file. I've got hundreds of files in my laptop where I have copy-pasted from my journal into my topical library. Then I'll send out one or two tweets and then I'll review my journal. Because if I just put it in my journal and don't review it, the only way I can hold on to any football that God throws me, I have to write it down, put it in my journal, and review. When I'm in a meeting such as we're in right now, where the Word of God is being taught, preached, proclaimed, and so forth, I always have three things with me. Did I say always? I have a Bible, I have a notepad, and I have a pen. You will not find me in a public meeting where the Word of God is being taught without three things. Bob, what is your deal? I'll tell you my deal. When I'm in a meeting like this, where the Word of God is being proclaimed, and as I'm in the middle of the message, get the best, the Holy Spirit throws me a football in the middle of the preacher's message. Can you imagine such a thing? When I get a football in a service like that, write that baby down. I go straight up from church to my laptop, right into my journal, copy paste it into my top of the library, and send out a tweet, and then review. When I'm in the secret place, I always have three things with me. Did I say always? You maybe maybe you know what they are. Daniel's gone, Bob, you're OC. 
OCD on this. <laughs> it's your right, Daniel. I am OCD. It's just that important to me because <coughs> I want more. And I'm going to prove myself a faithful steward of every word that he speaks to me. Lord Jesus, help me to be faithful to this, to guard this, because I want to be found faithful before you to so steward every word you give me that you'll give me another football. Just say it to your neighbor right now. Do not drop the ball. I close with one last verse. Proverbs 26, verse 20. Proverbs 26, verse 20, our final scripture. For where there is no one, the fire goes out. Has anybody here ever built a campfire? Said you're not a campfire. Let me ask you a question. Is that campfire still going? No. He stopped putting wood on the fire. If you want the flame of your heart to stay alive, you've got to keep putting wood on the altar of your heart. The wood is the word. And I think if you want a burning heart, I have a word for you. Go get some wood. Get into the logos. Put some fresh logos on the altar of your heart. Set yourself up to receive a rhema from God because this is what keeps our hearts alive. When your heart starts to cool off, Dr. Bob has a remedy for you. Go get some wood. Put some logos on the altar of your heart. Your eyes will light up. Your cheeks will flush. You'll come alive. And you'll be able to live another 40 days in your wilderness because we live by the words of his mouth. Let me pray for you now. Heavenly Father, I'm asking for every friend in this room that there will be fresh grace through the preaching of this word, fresh grace for their secret place, fresh momentum in their secret place. I'm asking, Abba, that, there, that, that the dove of the Spirit would come upon us when we have the word in front of us, dove of heaven. Would you come and rest upon that word? Would you speak us to us? I'm asking, Lord, that you would attempt my friends, to the rhemas of your mouth, that you would awaken us to the riches of what we have in this book. Awaken my, awaken my heart, Lord, that this might be the very thing that I live for, the very thing that makes me alive in you sitting at your feet, hearing the words of your mouth. I'm asking for fresh grace to sow. Lord, that my friends would have grace to sow every day to the secret place, every day into the locals, that they might reap from the secret place. Grace to hear. Lord, open our ears. Give us Mickey Mouse ears. Give us ears to hear what you are saying. Grace to catch the ball. Grace to hold on to the ball and cherish every word. Lord, may every person in this room find their own way of catching, holding on to, retaining the word of God that we might be found faithful, worthy to receive another word from your mouth. In Jesus' name I pray. Now here's what I would like to do this morning. I'd like to ask our prayer leaders if they would be willing to come forward. We've got some anointing oil this morning. I'm going to ask our prayer leaders to get some anointing oil in their hands. And before you leave, you're invited. If you want this, this is optional. You're welcome to be dismissed. But if you would like our leaders to anoint you with oil and bless you in the Holy Spirit, when we anoint people with oil, we believe that the oil represents the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it's a tangible way that we connect our faith with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when you're anointed with oil, you're just like, oh, the Holy Spirit, I just believe now that you are coming in power.
power and strength and grace to help me. We want to bless your secret place relationship with Jesus so that you go from this place with a sense of fresh encouragement and momentum and grace and help in the Lord. So if you want that kind of ministry, what, what I'm going to ask you to do is come forward, receive the anointing. We're going to pray for you and then when we have finished that prayer, if you don't mind returning to your seat so that someone else can find their way forward and, and, uh, and receive ministry. Uh, Brian Brené, would you mind joining us in this? And uh, uh, Pastor Kathy's got some leaders in the church. She'll attend. Would you be willing to join us in this? Would you mind? Okay, so we're going to have some of our leaders that are going to come forward. I'm going to ask Ray if you just help them to get some oil in their hands. Get some anointing oil in, their, in your hand. And, and then if you choose to come forward, say, the Holy Spirit give you whatever. You can be instrumental, it can be vocal, just whatever the Lord gives you. Uh, language for the moment, or just the spirit of, of uh, divinity music, just whatever God gives you. And I invite you to stand. <coughs> sure that you guys go through the book table but as he was finishing today I really felt like um, hearts were being awakened to the word I almost wanted to get up and cheer like, I felt like God's like awakening hearts he's awakening your hearts and then um, some of you need some of you do need some wood <laughs> need to come get some wood <laughs> Be with you throughout this entire week, and may the word of Jesus.